I'm, I'm sure we'll get it. <laughs> you sure it's home? <laughs> All right. Let's start with prayer and then we'll get into the word for tonight. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that by it you lead us and you guide us into truth. Father, we pray that as we're here tonight that we'll have open ears and open eyes to hear the truth and the spirit of your word, Father, and we thank you for bringing us revelation and for strengthening our faith as we look into it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to keep stirring up our minds in remembrance about God's promises concerning healing and receiving it. We know that as the end times move on, there seems to be plagues, pestilences, and new diseases coming out all the time. It's very important that we know how to receive healing from the Bible. And you know the Bible also says, let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're taking heed and we're looking into it again. Because we need to remain steadfast and fight the good fight of faith where healing and health are concerned. God's always able, but we have to abide in him and in his word, abounding in knowledge and living out what we know and increasing our faith. And faith really is the ability to endure until we see our hope become a natural reality. And we need to trust only in the Lord and lean on Him and not on the natural because then we have good success. Tonight we're going to look at someone who received a life-changing healing by turning in faith to God. And in a way, he had an advantage because there was nothing that any man could do to treat his disease. The natural world could not help him. He had to put his faith in God. And the God we serve rewards all those who diligently seek him. So let's turn to Second Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. We're going to be looking at Naaman tonight. And this is a really, this is an important story. You know, God promised health and healing to the Israelites, but Naaman wasn't a part of that covenant. But when he came to God, did God answer him? He did. Now, Naaman, it says, Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Oh my God, to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me 
and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying, of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. And there's a lot in this story that we can learn about healing and the, the anatomy of a healing. Here, healing starts with what you hear and with what you believe. A little girl who believed in God's power told Naaman's wife that there was a prophet in Israel who could hear him heal him. And then the wife believed, obviously, because she told Naaman, and Naaman, he believed, he told the king. The king believed also, and he sent Naaman to Israel with gifts. And so as a matter of courtesy, he went to the king, because even then, these two areas were sort of frenemies. I mean, you can see they were raiding. They had a little Israelite girl, so obviously they weren't exactly friends. And we know how the king reacted to Naaman. It scared him a little bit. He thought they were making up a reason to quarrel. Now we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes that way. But hearing is not enough. And before we come back to this, let's flip over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us what we have to do when we hear. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So what does the word have to be mixed with? We have to be joined with our faith. It's not enough to just hear it. It's not automatic either that just because we hear it, we'll believe it. Remember in the parable of the sower, where the guy was out planting the word of God. In 25% of the people, the word was stolen as soon as it came by offense or unbelief. So just because you hear something doesn't mean that you believe it. And just because you read or heard a verse or concept from the Bible many times, it does not believe that it does not mean that you necessarily believe it in your heart or that you've applied it to yourself. Sometimes we hear in the abstract and people will even tell people, oh, yeah, God can do that, God can do that. But until we apply it to ourselves and say that God can do that for me, that's when it becomes real to us. And there is a difference. Remember, name and active. Faith acts. Because until the Bible moves you to change your behavior, you are probably still stuck in unbelief. Because when God gives a promise, there's always something good ready for those who will receive it, isn't there? So if you want good in your life, it only stands to reason. It even makes sense that we would 
believe and go after it. So if we don't, we have to realize that could be unbelief. If we're not letting the Bible change our behavior, it's because we probably don't believe it. Not enough to act on it and to do what it says to do. Many Christians just accept sickness as a part of life. And the first step of faith is to admit to yourself that there shouldn't be disease in the temple of God and to start resisting it. That's the first step is to just recognize it shouldn't be there. It's not a part of a Christian's life because Jesus gives us eternal life. We can't just accept it. So we know from here that Naaman got his gifts and his things together and he traveled into what was potentially enemy territory to get his healing. He believed and he moved. If he had continued on as usual, he would have been a leper until he died, wouldn't he? He would have been a leper until he died if he just continued on in, as usual. But he changed. He did something different. Now, as believers, we don't necessarily have to get up and go see somebody else. Okay? Because we have the Holy Spirit in our heart. We do have to seek God. And we can seek the Holy Spirit who lives in our heart. Naaman had to go to Israel to seek God because there was no Holy Spirit. There was no Spirit living in his heart. He wasn't even a part of the covenant. He probably didn't know God's word to act on it. He had to get up and go somewhere to get in the anointing. But another key to being able to receive healing is knowing that the Holy Spirit is inside you. And you can talk to him about that. Any manifestation of a sickness can be seen as either an attack or a sign that God's not working on your body. His anointing isn't working in your body for some reason like it should be. Because I think it's Romans that says the spirit quickens, quickens our mortal bodies. He's supposed to be doing something in them. He's supposed to be changing them for health. Okay? And if we need to seek God to find out what that is, what's going on, and what to do about it. The first step of faith is to stop just accepting things and to go to God and to be humble enough to say, why is this happening, and listen for the answer. We're going to go back and review some healing scriptures, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. And this is about the work of Jesus. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And now we're going to flip back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Looking back on that, Peter wrote about it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. And I mentioned this last week, but this is a revelation that sets people up for victory in the fight of faith against sickness. And it's just one simple truth. Because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, which he gave, you are already healed. We need to learn that that's how God sees us. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. We are already healed. The devil, circumstances, the weakness of your body may be trying to bring disease on you. But the beginning of the fight is knowing that you are not sick and trying to get well. And that's how so many people look at it, isn't it? As soon as something happens, they say, oh, I'm sick and now I have to go try to get well. The opposite, the truth is actually the direct opposite of that. You are in fact healed. And disease is trying to come to you and work in your body. And it's up to you to not let it, to not allow it. 
That is the truth. That is how God sees us. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. We are already healed. And something is trying to make us sick. And we talked last week, sickness comes from many different places. It doesn't matter where it comes from. The Holy Spirit can handle it in you. But we need to, the fight of faith begins by saying, no, I am healed and this is trying to come on me and I'm not going to let it. Because if you take sickness in your mind, if you believe in it, it will manifest in your body. Eventually, it will. A lot of people take, for example, the flu in their mind before they ever have a symptom in their body. You can hear it when they say things like, I always get sick this time of year. My relatives all died of this in their 70s, and I guess I will too. Another one, half of the office is out with this disease. I probably can't escape it either. Learn a lesson from Job, the lesson of Job. What you fear, the negative things that you believe in, will come upon you, even if God favors you, because he does favor you as your child. But if you're going to believe it and take it in your mind, it will happen in your body. It does come that way. How do you know when sickness has been taken in your mind? It starts changing how you walk with God. That's when you know that you've taken it. Hebrews 10 talks about holding on to your expectation without wavering. And it also talks about not neglecting coming together. If we allow sickness or the fear of sickness to change what we're doing, We've already taken it in our mind. You know, God does not have sickness in his presence, does he? There is no sickness in heaven because it's not a part of him. It's not in his presence. So we need to realize this too. If sick people enter this service, we should be expecting the anointing to drive it out of them. Even if sick people enter our presence, we should be expecting the anointing to drive it out of them. We shouldn't be expecting their sickness to come on us because they were around us. I mean, you know, you've heard the story before. John G. Lake told it, and it's true. He let them put that bacteria that was killing people, I can't remember what it was, like, the bubonic plague, um, on his hands. And it just died. Remember that story? It just died. We can't take it with our minds. God doesn't have sickness in his presence, and we need to start depending on the anointing within us to drive it away. Now, let's look back at Second Kings 5. Again. Now we're going to reread verses 7 and 8. It says, Then it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. And we know that then Elijah said that he could come see him. Even the king, the king recognized that it was God that does the work, right? Even the king recognized that it's God that does the work. When we obey what the Bible says and lay hands on the sick, or even when we speak over ourselves, we need to remember when we're ministering to other people, it's not about us. It's about God, right? It's about what he can do. Even when we're speaking to our Bibles, our bodies or speaking over ourselves because we're feeling symptoms, it's not about us. It's about God and what he can do. Jesus healed everyone who came to him, who believed. And healing is not just for those who are born again, although it is part of our covenant. It's for all those who believe. Now, how many of you have ever heard a Christian say, no, I don't want prayer? I have. I've heard people, no, no, I don't want prayer. 
They don't believe it'll work. And will it work for them? No. No. It could if they would just believe. But even some of God's children don't believe and it won't work for them. Some Christians won't even think about going to God until they go to see what the doctor has said about it. It's okay to go to the doctor, but we need to go to God also. And we need to recognize that science has become a God in this country. And if you didn't believe it, you know now, because during COVID-19, what were they all supposedly following? The science. Now, you can argue about whether or not they really were or had science on their side. The point is, what was making, the, what was driving the decision-making? Science. And what they believed about it. If science and the natural world are where your believing is centered, you are cutting off the supernatural in your life. If that's where your faith is and that's where you're looking at. The Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. And we need to start believing in God regardless of what science says about any of it. Now when we seek God, we need to be prepared to do what he tells us to do. Remember what happened to Naaman? Was he prepared to go dip in the Jordan at first? No, we read it. He was angry, wasn't he? And he went back and he actually expressed, this is what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to wave his hand and do this and that. Now, how many people come to God telling him, this is what I want you to do? I want to go to this meeting or I want to go here and this, this is what I want you to do. And then, you know, Naaman at least heard the other way. We have to realize sometimes when we're doing that, it's going to cut off our ability to hear what God really wants to do. If we're the ones trying to tell him, this is what I want you to do, and getting angry about what he wants us to do. Because there are times when he says, yeah, go to the doctor and do that. And some people say, you know what, that's not my idea. I want you to just touch me and do away with it. And there are people who have died because of that. People that we knew that have died because they wouldn't do. And they weren't listening. They weren't open to what God wanted them to do. They wanted it to happen their way. We have to let God be God and do, even if we don't feel like or don't want to go through what he wants us to do, whether it's with the doctors or in a different way. Because, you know, when you go to doctors about certain things, they will let you make certain decisions for yourself. Get with God when you make those decisions. But when we seek God, we need to be prepared to do what he tells us to do. Obedience is always required. And, you know, sometimes people just don't want to have to step up. But if you don't step up when the Spirit says to, you are sending out that little beacon light to the devil that says, here's somebody that, you know, you can come in and attack. We have to be willing to step up and to be obedient. And he can see when we're not. Now, Naaman had good friends who encouraged him to humble himself and to just go and do what the prophet had spoken from the Lord. These men took the journey with him, and they encouraged him in the Lord. And you know, that's the importance of the church family, and that's what we need to be for everybody else. We need to encourage them to walk humbly and to follow the Lord, because church is more than just teaching. It's about using our faith for each other, encouraging people, and urging other people on when they're tired. It's about inviting the presence of God into our services as a group of individuals with one heart so that people who are struggling can come and experience the presence and the power of God and be encouraged to walk with him and to choose life. Now, we know that Naaman did what he was told to do. 
And because God had compassion on him, Naaman became a servant of God. He recognized that the God in Israel is a God who works on behalf of his people. He decided that who he would serve, a God with power who does good. There are benefits to walking with God, and we're going to flip over and read some of them right now, starting with Psalm 103. There are benefits to walking with God, but it does not ever mean that you're just going to walk on and there isn't going to be a trial. The devil is not going to try to attack or do something. It happens, but the Lord always has a way out. Psalm 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Now, this is a psalm, but we know that forgiveness and healing were purchased with the blood of Jesus, and they are benefits of salvation, because that's what he talked about in the Last Supper when he was instituting the New Covenant. And some things that help us to being able to receive from the Lord, remembering that he's merciful and gracious. Those two things often are seen together. Mercy is his willingness to not give you what you deserve. And grace is his willingness to empower you and to help you. And these benefits are for people who keep his covenant and remember his command. And technically, everyone who calls themselves a Christian should be doing this. But the truth is, many don't. It's not about whether or not we make mistakes. But it is about where your heart is. Now let's turn over to Psalm 91. And we're going to read that one again also. Just to remember the benefits. And to put our eyes on them. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. 
Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now remember, what we say about God and what we believe about God dictate how much or how little he can work in our lives. Jesus said to the blind men and to many other people, according to your faith, be it unto you. What are you saying and believing about Father God today? Also, we talked about, are you caught up in the natural? To walk in divine health, we have to renew our minds to the truth that we've already been healed. If you're being attacked with sickness for any reason, it's time to fight back and keep what was purchased for us, but see it as that, as a keeping and a holding on to what you have, not as being sick and trying to get well. See yourself as healed and symptoms as an attempt to take that away rather than the opposite. Because we know that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. The work has already been done. The blood of Jesus was shed so that we can enjoy the benefits of being with God. But we have a choice about what we believe and we have a choice about how we live. And those choices do affect our ability to receive. But when you know God's word and believe it and set yourself to obey, nothing will be impossible for you. Next week we're going to start talking about how to fight the good fight of faith as it pertains to healing. But just realize as we go out, the first things that we look at and the first things that we think about when we get attacked are so important. They're really the key to whether we take it or whether we don't. I mean, just for a real life, real time example, and this kind of always happens when you um, start talking about healing, you kind of set yourself up to be an attack, you know? And I'll just say this, just so you know, this is this is what we have, this is how we fight it, okay? I was getting, we were getting ready for service last Wednesday night, and I started to feel so sick, and my hands were shaking, and I just thought I needed to run, to run to the bathroom. Now, how many were here last week? Did anybody see that happen? Hmm? No? But there was an attack going on, but I didn't race out to the bathroom, did I? Didn't lose it. I stayed and I played. And I know people expect that because I'm a pastor. I mean, I've heard people say that, but the truth is everybody has to be that strong. And I had to learn to be that strong a lot earlier. The point is, things attack and things happen. And I just said, no, you're not going to do that devil, went and sat behind the piano. But how many times would so many people have run to the bathroom? Or how many times have people looked up and just said, nope, all right, that's it, I'm sick, I can't do it. When we look up and say, okay, that's it, I'm sick and I can't do it, do you realize what have you just done? You've taken it. You've taken it and you've accepted it. It was... Brother Hagen used to call it an invitation and say that it's one that you could decline. And that's how simple it is to decline it. But that's right away when it comes. You have to have your head and your wits about you right away. You have to say, wait, no, I'm not sick. I'm healed. You're trying to make me sick and I'm saying that I'm not going to take it. And that's just an example in real time. 
but we do have to stand strong in order to see the victory. And it starts, so much of it, it starts with what happens right then when you first feel it. What do you do? What do you believe? Do you shove it away or are you saying, oh well, I guess I'm sick. And we're going to start talking more next week about fighting the good fight of faith. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, Father. We're here because we believe you, because we trust you. We trust your word. We trust your goodness and your mercy, Father. We know that you have compassion, even as we read in your word, because we've experienced it, Father. We thank you, Father, for leading us and guiding us into truth. We thank you that you are our salvation in every area of life, whether we need healing or provision, whether we need peace or wisdom, Father, you are our salvation and our hope, and you do hold the answers and the victory for us who believe. And we thank you, Father, for it. And we thank you for imparting it to us by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.